Hi and welcome to the second episode of REST as in Hypermedia together with Java. In this episode we will cover the server-side implementation using Java EE and JAXRS to implement the REST and HTTP APIs I introduced in the first episode. So let's just start with the project. We still have the documentation here of the different levels of HTTP and now we will create a new Java E7 project with the JAXRS resources. I will use Maven for this. I have a bash script here that um, creates something like a Maven archetype. Let's call it coffee shop. And this just created a project structure. And I will use IntelliJ to open this. And in order that you get an idea of how this is done, I will just start from scratch. So I have nothing prepared up front. And this is just a plain empty Java E7 project. It contains the Java E7 API, which is provided. That means it doesn't end up in your WAR file. And this is everything you need, actually. So we don't need any other dependency for building hypermedia APIs together with Java. What is already there in our Maven project is the JAXRS configuration class. This is needed to bootstrap the JAXRS application and registers a servlet mapped under resources, which is the root resource of our JAXRS. And now we will um, create JAXRS resources. For example, a root resource, which uses add path to specify this POJO as a JAXRS root resource class. And we can map it, for example, to slash, which is just equal to the root um, resource. And then at get or at post a method. That means the method annotated with this um, HTTP method designator will enable to um, call this method when the HTTP um, request is called. That means the HTTP request for post is mapped to this method and will implicitly call it by the IOC container. So for example, we have the get coffee types method, which just outputs a list of strings. And the nice story is, with JAXRS, we can use Java types, which will automatically be mapped to corresponding output. And in this case, we want to have JSON. So we want to have a JSON array, and we can control with annotations how the output looks like, which content type is used for both the request and response bodies. And for these response bodies here, we want to produce JSON. So we call media type application JSON. And this is the content type, which is then returned by HTTP. And now JAXRS knows that it should produce this list of string as a JSON array. And the list of string comes from an EJB or a CDI managed bean in this case. Coffee shop. And this will now give us our coffee types here. So we will just call our bean to give us coffee types. And normally we would query the database or load the coffee types uh, from somewhere or even call an external system. So all the business logic is done here. But for now, as we want to focus on the REST and JAXRS side, we would just create um, dummy data. Let's get coffee types. We had espresso and let's say pour over from arrays as lost. And now this is returned 
and will then be returned as JSON array data. And as you saw, for this approach of the HTTP API with just the RPC style, we have um, several methods mapped to resource method names. And in the first uh, video, I uh, told you why you probably don't want to do this. But as I said, if you have tightly coupled clients and servers, you of course can follow this approach and then you map the resource to that method name. And now let's run the example. We will use Maven to build the project. So I call just Maven clean install to package everything to a WAR file and then I will deploy it. In my case, I use Wi-Fi. This is a recent Wi-Fi 10 version. This was just a script that takes the WAR file of the target directory and deploys it automatically. So I don't have to copy things around all over again while I'm the, while I'm developing locally. And now we can curl our service. I will use curl in this example, but you get the idea that it doesn't matter because now we have HTTP and every HTTP capable technology can just query our service. So in the third episode, I will tell you how to do this with Java, but for now, let's just um, stick to the command line because it actually doesn't matter. Localhost 8080. Coffee shop is the context um, name and we have resources as the application name and then we can query this 404 no found because this um, JAXRS resource class is annotated with add path, path slash, but it doesn't have um, a method that handles the requests on this level, but only on this sub resource. So we will call like as in the example, get coffee types, we will query this resource. And then we still get 405 uh, not allowed because it's a get, as I said, for our example, we'll be use post um, to do everything because it's a method, RPC style. And now we get our data back. And this is now JSON data. As you can see, we can then process this further and format it and so on and so forth. So this is how you call um, HTTP RPC style methods over the wire, over HTTP. But actually, we want to apply more of the rest constraints. So let's go to resources. And in order to do so, we of course have to have several resource classes because then we're talking about types, we're talking about orders and bean origins. So for now, let's remap this resource to types because we get our coffee types by uh, querying this resource now with a get and then we get the same coffee types back. So this will be the types resource, types resource, and we will now get this resource under types. And then it's the same story, it will return the coffee types. And the same is true for the espresso um, origins or actually for the coffee um, origins and then you see how to use path parameters. So let's create a second resource called coffee um, origin what's the name coffee uh, origins resource so we could now annotate this with the same path again, or we can use something called sub resource locator as we here already mapped under types. Um, so we don't have to type types again for the other resource rather than we can um, go further down in the hierarchy and um, continue the path with the espresso and then origins. And now we can return the resource here. 
which means we tell JAXRS that everything under path Espresso origins will be handled by the origins resource. This would be the same story if we annotate the origins resource with add path and that string directly. But this is another nice way of structuring your JAXRS application. Origins resource and then we can return the resource which we um, either instantiate ourselves or use a JAXRS mechanism from a resource context which is a context managed object and can be injected via add context resource context and then we call resource context and get resource with a class name which creates the resource and then does all the JAXRS magic from injection and so on and so forth and we will return this and you probably saw now espresso is not the only thing we want to have because we want to have espresso we want to have pour over and french press and so on and so forth and of course we don't want to repeat ourselves all over again to have a specific resource for espresso french press and so on and so forth rather than this should be dynamic and this is called a path parameter so now we will have type in curly brackets which will then substitute with the appropriate type when called. This means that now any HTTP request to types slash something slash origins will be handled via this resource. And then specifically in the resource and the um, resource class itself doesn't need to be annotated now but only the methods can handle this via get for example by giving a list of string again with the origins the bean origins of the specific type get origins and now as I said we have the path parameter so this method and actually the whole class is mapped to type slash origins with the parameter inside. This means we can access the path parameter by at path param with a name, so the annotation value which equals the name in the brackets, like type. And then we have the type accessible and injected by the IOC container in our method. And since the path parameter is available in the whole JAXRS resource class, we can also have it as a field because each and every method will have this available in the method body. So now we can um, yeah, include our EJB again, the coffee shop, and now ask the coffee shop for the bean origins for the specific type. Return coffee shop, get origins for the coffee type. And as I said, we just include dummy data here. So let's um, add some bean origins like Colombia, El Salvador, and so on and so forth. And then you could include the business logic on the HFP side, of course. And now this is called um, by the type. And this is how the get um, side works here with path parameters. And now we want to post something. So we want to create a new order. As I said, so we want to post something to the orders resource. And since this is more complex than just a string, we now have to have our objects in our JAXRS resource class. Let's create a new resource called orders resource, which is mapped to orders, and will then produce and consume JSON via add produces and add consumes annotations 
And now we want to create a new resource via post. This post is mapped to orders, which creates a new order. And the order here, which is not JPA, but a new class defined by ourselves, will then be included from the request body. This means this um, parameter here is not annotated with anything and that tells JAXRS that it's going to be the request body. In this case, serialized from JSON. We will call our EJB again, coffee shop. Create order from our order here. And now our business logic, business logic creates the order. And this order here now is a POJO containing, of course, a type and origin, which is the coffee type and the coffee origin. And as we later on need an ID to identify it as well, let's um, create this ID as well. This could be a string or a long, whatever you need. If you want to have the technical IDs from the database ID, for example, this um, is done very often. Or you could um, also just generate a UUID, what I would do in this case. And later on, we will know that the order also needs a, needs a status um, down there. So we already um, created a status. And now you can see for the sake of the examples, I did strings for types and origins, but the status should be an enum, of course, because now we are mapping a POJO, so we are designing business entities. Of course, we don't want to have strings, we want to have type safe um, properties like order status. And the order status will be an enum with preparing, finished, and collected. This will be then included in the order. I just um, generate some getters and setters, and then we can log it a nice two string method. And just because we want to have um, basic examples, I will create custom and default constructors so we can construct them easily. And that's basically it. That's a simple POJO. And now, in our resource, we will just create this. And the same as before is true when we get and put one specific order. So now, we can get the sub-resource of an order, which um, of course returns an order. Um, with a path parameter of a specific ID and then the coffee shop is queried to load the order from the database or in our case we would just create one with dummy data order which is a coffee type espresso from Colombia and the status is let's say finished This will be returned here. And of course, if we want to collect our coffee later on, we have to put to the resource to update the status. And that means we will have the same thing again, update order. This method now is void with an ID as a path parameter. And of course, the order again as the updated order. You saw the same thing in the create order method. And then just uh, call the coffee shop to update the order.
And as I said, the void method, um, if you have a void method in a Jux REST resource, then this will be mapped to status code 204 no content, as you don't have a um, response here and it totally makes sense. But for our examples, we had the 204 no content for the update method or update action. And for the create an order action, we had 201 created with a location header. And in order to do so, we will have to modify that method a little bit. So the nice story um, about JAXRS it is that per default, it tries to do as many things for you as possible, which means now we're here just um, writing normal Java without any JAXRS um, um, plumbing or boilerplate code required. But if you want to have more um, control over several things, for example, a different status code, then you can do this as well by having, for example, another return type, response in this case. And here, um, we will return response, um, a response object, which is um, created programmatically by the builder pattern fashion, which means we would call status. And then we have all the HTTP status codes available, like status created and so on and so forth. But actually there's already a shortcut dot created method, which will um, include 201 created status code plus a location header field, which is this one. So as this is a standard approach for creating resources, um, there is a nice method for it. And then we have the order URI and then dot build. So two things, the create order method now should set an ID because we need it. And for example, we can have a UUID random approach to generate a random UUID, which is um, then included in the order. And we will have to create a URI. For example, we could call URI.create from a string and then something like orders with, of course, all the paths up front. And then we concatenate that with order get ID, but this is actually quite cumbersome. And of course, you don't want to repeat yourselves all over again. And now I want to show you a nice um, functionality from JAXRS who creates that URIs for you with the information already available. Because this order path part, for example, is already included over there. And you don't want to repeat yourself, which means you use a functionality called URI info, which is also injected via add context, and can be used to create URIs with the information already there. So you have several URI builders available, and these URI builders contain um, information on based on your application and based on the request. So for example, base URI builder gives you the URI already included with the base application paths. And then you can call dot path to, for example, um, extend the path with path parts. And either you do it via string or a nice story is you can point to class and methods. This means from the orders resource class, JAXRS knows that it's annotated with add path and it will take the value of this annotation, namely orders, and append it to the path. And the same is true for methods. You will point to it by using the class name or the, the class plus the method name, get order. And this will now point to that method. Of course, then, if you use this approach, the method names have to be unique. But as you don't use the methods directly, rather than they are called by the IOC container, it doesn't matter that much if you have this constraint to having unique method names. And then you build it to a URI. And of course, as you saw that we have the path parameter included down there, you may want to substitute this because for the actual URI, you want to have the actual URI with the ID, of course. 
So the build, build method takes arguments, for example, the order get ID in this case. And this will then substitute all the path parameters in order of appearance. And then we have the order URI, which is then included. And that's pretty much it. And now we see that we covered all the use cases and we will run the example again. So we will rebuild it via Maven clean install and then deploy it on a Wildfly and then test uh, whether we did everything right. And this will be then the first approach of calling these resources and then I will show you um, what else would be needed for a real REST service as you want to validate stuff and maybe control the, um, the output. So for now, get coffee types, of course, is now no longer available. This is now called types. And it will give us the uh, types here. And then we know that types, for example, espresso, origins, will give us the origins. And there's a typical error I forgot to annotate it with uh, produces and consumes. So that was um, types and origins. This is a typical error when you see there is no message body writer available because it doesn't know what to do per default um, application octet stream. That's the content type, but of course that's wrong. We want to have JSON. So for this case, um, the sub resource has to be annotated like um, all of them have. And when we rebuild it, we can then query it and get the correct um, response. And that, as I said, works for all the um, coffee types. So we could have espresso or pour over and so on and so forth. And now in this uh, example, it's always the same origins. And now let's create something. Let's create an order. So we have to post to the URI called orders. Post. And we want to post JSON data in our case. So we include a header called um, content type and then we include the data um, as JSON which is then a type espresso with bean origins from Colombia and now it says two one created fine the server locked it new order has been created and then we have the location HTTP um, URI as well to pointing to orders with the ID. And as other uh, as in this example, you want to have absolute URIs in your application. So I just um, did this here. It's uh, so that it's more readable. But actually, you always want to include the absolute URI because then when using Hypermedia, the client can just take the URI and use it then in the next uh, request again. So this is uh, how it works. But as you saw, now you may want to um, use some more logic and may add some validation, for example. Because when you see um, the orders, and now this is actually the first example of hypermedia because now I can really take the URI um, and use it for the next request. So this is basically um, what then my hypermedia client would do that it just takes the um, URI as is and use it for the next uh, request here. But let's add two more things. First of all, you see that finish is, of course, the uppercase because that's the default um, from the enum mapping. And 
you saw that when we post data here, we could, for example, also manipulate and say, oh, let's say our coffee is already finished. And of course, that's not valid because the client can only order a coffee and then you have to prepare it. So let's say if we want to use this approach that we want to use the domain entities directly from the JAXRS resource. So this order, the order in this case, we could of course also introduce another transfer object, but I will show you another approach in a couple of minutes. But if you want to do so, you can do this as well because JAXRS um, fortunately integrates well with Bean validation. And I want to show you this right now. So if you annotate the order with add valid, then you will see that the bean validation validator will be caught automatically. And if the validation fails, mapped to an appropriate status code, 400 bad request. And this is the nice story that JAXRS, as I said, tries to integrate everything from both the Java side and the HTTP side. And then by, uh, by um, annotating the request um, body with add valid, the validation will uh, be called automatically. So let's say the order has not null constraints on the two things here. And by um, doing so, then it will be rejected. But what you could also do is include um, a specific validator. For example, you say that now we want to have a little bit more uh, business logic, not only the valid, um, that the origin and the type may not be null, rather than the update, in our case, should be the collect the coffee use case which means we want to update the status to collect it and nothing else. So if the coffee is already been, has been finished, then we can't say no, update back to preparing. That's not valid. So we can annotate this with, uh, with add valid. And now what I want to show you is to create a custom constraint val um, validation, which we can include. And we will call this annotation for example, um, updated. Updated is fine. And then, and this is now bean validation functionality, we can use a constraint violator, validator. Updated order validator. And by doing so, we will have a validator for our order POJO and then we say oh actually our um, order must be valid here and the updated order must be valid means that the order status must equal now to collected and if not then return the validation violation here. And then we annotate it with updated, or you could also name it updated order. And then this validator will be called automatically. And if the validation fails, it says bad request. So let's try this for now. We will rebuild um, the example and redeploy it on Wi-Fi and we can already pre prepare our request by saying now we want to put to the specific um, resource and we're putting the data with Espresso from Columbia but only finished which would then say oh 400 bad request because the validation um, validator has been called and it says, oh, it's not valid because it's not collected. Everything else is valid and we can um, try this out by saying collected. Now it's valid 
And if we um, leave out one field, then it's invalid as well. And let's add another thing. For example, you wanna give the developers of the client developers more information what is invalid because now you're not really friendly you just say oh that's invalid with 400 bad requests but well what was invalid so as a client you say well that's nice but actually what would be valid so let's include more information for example as an HTTP header and in order to do so you can have an extension for JAXRS which maps the internal constra constraint violation exception to something usable from um, HTTP's perspective, which means we will include a constraint violation exception mapper, which implements exception mapper from JAXRS for constraint violation exception. And this exception mapper here is responsible to map, to ca actually catch an exception and map it then to a response. So we could do whatever you, we like here. We could even say, oh, it's 200 okay, because of some reason. But now say, constraint violation exception is of course a bad request. And let's say we want to include headers as well. For example, x validation error with some nice message and then build everything to the response just as before. And now we want to include a string that comes now with enriched data. And let's say the data comes from the exception and with the constraint violation exception, we can access constraint violations. And this is now a beam validation logic. And let's say, well, we map um, the violations to oh actually give us the property path plus something usable like the message and then we collect this whole thing to our string so now we have all the um, constraint violations and then include it in that HTTP header and in order to access this functionality, so we want to mm, configure it that JAXRS uses that exception mapper. And in order to do so, we use add provider annotation. And then by bootstrapping the application, JAXRS will scan for these um, providers, for example, for our exception mapper and include it. And this is the nice story that we don't need anything else because um, the this extension mechanism and it works kind of like the like a plugin um, la, like this uh, pr uh, plugin approach we can use it right away and we don't need co to configure anything else if you would not use add provider then our JAXRS configuration class where I wrote nothing to configure would here um, has to have some logic to configure that but this is the easier approach. And now we say, oh, origin may not be null. Let's say, oh, of course, origin from El Salvador. And now it's valid again. And this um, is a helpful functionality for developers. Another uh, thing I mentioned before, we probably want to remap the enum here to the lowercase values, for example, and a nice workaround is to include at XML annotations. So workaround for what? Well, workaround for not having a standard to map POJOs to JSON output yet. So for Java E8, the expert group of so-called JSON B is already working to uh, finalize that specification and include it then to Java E8 umbrella, but it's not uh, finished yet. And there is for now only JAXB, which is the same thing for XML. And the add XML enums or add XML annotations are 
the same thing to control the XML output. But the nice workaround is that most of the um, JSON mapping frameworks take these an annotations into account as well, which means that although it's mapped to JSON here, in my example, I could also say produces media type XML, of course, but still it's doable to control the output, for example, with enum value and then preparing. And we will do this for all the um, annotations here. And then it will be used as the lowercase values. So now you saw how to use validation and how to uh, remap the output if you use POJOS on the JAXRS side. And then you can implement HTTP APIs with resources and domain entities approaches that you use the semantic HTTP to modify resources. And now you see that we got a nice exception, which means it works because I updated collected, which of course should be now lowercase, and then it works. So this is now mapped um, to the lowercase here. And the same is true if we query a resource and then ask for one specific order. With pretty printed as well. So now you see how to how the output is controlled. And now we want to move forward with our REST approach, which means we want to include some hypermedia. And now you see that the JSON output or the output of the content type in general won't be that straightforward, as we don't have only um, properties on the JSON, but also the meta information, like links or later on control actions. And this can be then done by using more fully fledged at XML logic in the annotations, but which means, for example, these links here could be a map and then the map is um, mapped to underscore links and included with relations and your eyes. But actually, I want to show you another approach which gives you more control over the output. And the reason for this is that we figured out a lot and actually all kind of APIs we designed that if you include hypermedia, you may want to have more control how the output looks like. In terms of sometimes you include a link based on your business logic if some business use case is available right now in the current status and so on and so forth, or you don't include the link or the link can change and you get the story which means you want to have more control how the output looks like. And as we found out, it really makes sense to have and use this control on the output side for the JSON. And how to realize this? Well, there is a nice functionality in Java E7 called JSONP, Java API for JSON processing. And this enables you to programmatically create JSON objects and JSON arrays. And the nice story is, again, because of the Java E umbrella, JAXRS, as in Beam Validation before, has to work well with JSONP as well. That means if you get the JSONP objects for either the request body or the response body, then JAXRS has to know that it's a JSON and B, how to handle it, so how to serialize or deserialize it. For example, we want the first approach here with our links that we will be included in, in our root resource. And of course, this is, I would say, like a dynamic object as you don't have a POJO for it, or you probably don't want um, to map this to a transfer object and then modify the output uh, everywhere. So let's 
start with the root resource like in the very uh, first example and now the root resource will be an index of in this case a JSON object this comes from Java x.json I will just call it index mapped to HTTP get and then it will include the hypermedia links to the specific resources namely we can use json.create object builder to create a new well object builder and then add some information like here we have a nested object immediately like the underscore links which means we have links and then we can also of course nest our calls here json create object builder another one and this time add links for types with the types URI and orders with the orders URI and at the end build it to a JSON object and now the URI is of course created in the same way as before So it's basically the same logic for the orders and types URI, which is the URI info injected as a context managed object and used to create the URI builders from the orders resource. And now we only need the path to the resource itself slash orders without any substitution and for the types the same is true for the types resource and these URIs are then included in the JSON output and JSONP doesn't support the URI types out of the box. You would have to call dot to string and add to string to the JSON object. And this is then built to a JSON object. And the JSON object is um, type is known to JAXRS and then it will be automatically mapped to JSON. And now, as we call this JSON object, our transfer object um, actually, then of course it will be JSON so we don't have to add at produces this case so no errors because of forgotten annotations but it will be mapped um, to JSON anyway and then you will see that this appears in the resource as well and the nice story now is that we have the full control over how our JSON output looks like so no matter which hypermedia enabled content type we're using we can add uh, whatever we like In our output links to the types and the orders resource like in our example and the same is true for the types resource so by having the coffee types now we want to have a JSON array with JSON objects having the type and the links to the types origin so now get coffee types from the EJB gives us the, the coffee types and actually if I think about it, if I call it EJB then it should be an EJB but well as Java E is uh, usable like straight away for our example this won't be any difference and then we can stream it as we're using Java 8 to um, a JSON array which means we have to map it first to a JSON object because each and every content, um, sorry, co uh, coffee type will be a JSON object nested and then collected to a JSON array. So the type will be mapped to um, JSON create, uh, create object builder, add the type name called type and the type string. And of course, a URI at links. So this is also included in a nested um, 
JSON object, just as before. And then we add our relation to origins and then the URI again. Origin URI, or we do it um, inline from the URI info. which is again the URI info object injected via JAXRS and then built to the origins resource and now I have to look into the resource Oh, um, as you see, now this is a sub-resource and the actual path is somewhere else. So you really have to um, see which object is and which method is annotated. So as you can see here, it's actually the types resource class and then the method down there with types resource class origins resource. built with, of course, the substituted type, which is T, and then with uh, dot two string added to the JSON as well. And this is then be mapped to a JSON object, and then at the end collected to a JSON array calling method handles create array builder json array builder add and then several json array builders added um, together by calling dot uh, builds we would do this into a json array and that's basically it and the same is true for our origins here So we have a JSON array again and our origins are then just collected to a JSON array builder and then as before query together. So let's run this example again and then you will see um, the same output now with um, included links. So we can um, call resources um, again that you see the links and now we can really follow everything by the provided URIs and then see the output of the espresso type linked to the URIs. And now in this case um, we of course um, want to have the lower case here because I included uh, this logic in the URI but now of course this depends on your business logic. And then we can use this URI as well and now will give us the types and the origins based on the types. And if um, the, the rest is pretty much straightforward for all the outputs. But for example, if you want to use the um, JSON object as a request body as well, this is totally doable. So let's say we change our orders resource as well to create, for example, an order based of a JSON object. For example, as I said, if your transfer, uh, transfer object, and in this case, JSON object is your transfer object, um, differs from how your domain entities look like, like your entity beans, then it totally makes sense to, to have a separate type. And in this case, J, um, the JSON objects or the JSON, JavaX um, JSON types give you 
and as functionality to have more control, which means as you create the JSON objects programmatically um, as well, you can also read from them um, programmatically. So for this case, we have a JSON object. And as I said, um, it, in, it integrates nice with uh, JAXRS, so you don't need to do anything else. And it also integrates um, nice with beam validation. But of course, it doesn't know what a JSON object um, type, uh, what it means that it's valid. Because JSON object, the type, is not defined by your application. It's included in Java EA. So we, you would need um, to have a known validator. And as we already have a validator for an updated order down there, you can also have a validator for the same thing. So let's say we will have another validation constraint with created order, which is validated by created order validator. The same um, story as before. But now this constraint um, validator is mapped to JSON object. And then it works that you do this with a JSON object type. Add created enables this validator to be called. And then you can um, check if this is valid. And JSON dot and then get some types enables you to ask for the specific um, data of the JSON object. So for example, we have types and origins for the created um, order validator and nothing else. So let's say create string, a get string from type and origin. And per default, this throws a null pointer exception if it's not included. So let's um, do the handling uh, for ourselves and say it's null per default. Then you get either this type string or null. The same is true for the origin. And then you can say, oh, actually, if our type um, is null, then um, return false. And as we have the exception mapper, now you um, may also want to have your own um, con constraint violation. Because otherwise it would just fail and say, well, it's not valid. But as I said, if you want to include more information, then you can use the context object here. And now this is again beam validation uh, functionality to build your own constraint violation. So let's say um, may not be null. And it's the same thing uh, um, like default. So actually you can have the message because this is a template which is available in Java E per default. And then an add um, the property node, uh, which is type, and then add the constraint validation. This is just uh, meta information what failed for validating, which means I will use this template and per default it says may not be null, and the property, which may not be null, in this case type, and then add the violation to the context. And the same is true for the origin. and then we can validate this. And now, of course, we have to map, 
we still have to map the data from our JSON object to our POJO. And in order to do so, we can um, include some functionality that reads from the JSON object. And now, as we already, um, as we can rely that the, con um, that the validation has been called, we know that the information for the type and the origin must be there. So we can ask our JSON object to give us the type and the origin and then return a new order and then depending on your business logic of course um, let's say that's preparing per default we can also set that in the EJB it depends how you want to structure your business logic but um, you can see that now this was created from JSON and the validation also works in the same way and now we still need to change the um, existing functionality so that means we have to that was wrong create order from json as well from the order here And this time we can say, oh, actually, if the status is available, then map this from um, from the status here. So now we we also include logic how to map the string to the enum. For example, by order status um, value of or we say values because we don't want to have an exception here, stream of values, and then filter all our statuses our st um, available by name equals ignore case to our status string, and then return it or null, or in this case, and we can already do the preparing and get rid of this. So now this will create our status from a JSON or if it's not available then it says well it's preparing. And as I said we have the updated constraint validation and our updated order validator but now this is not bound to order anymore rather than to JSON object and then it means that JSON object gets string from status must be Collected, because now we want to collect our or, um, our order, our coffee, and then say name um, to lowercase must equal status. And then 
and it's valid. And if not, we can have the same logic as before with the constraint and violations, which means if it's not equal, then please throw an arrow in this case and return false and build a constraint violation for the status. And what is also um, important to mention that you want to disable the default constraint violation here and in, in the other validator as well, because otherwise it will always um, in disable default. Otherwise, it will always um, include a constraint violation for the default object. In this case, the JSON object itself. And if you don't want to have this, rather than having um, constraint violations for the specific properties, then you want to disable the default one. But as I said, this is beam validation logic here. And now we can run the example again and then see how the output and the validation logic looks when we used our, our JSONP approach. So we can curl the origins just as before. We can curl the um, coffee types. But now we want to use the orders um, resource and we want to post to it. So post um, with the data just as before. And we want to inc um, include a new uh, coffee order and because of this it uh, it already um, includes another status so either we uh, we want to check that in our created validator to um, explicitly not having uh, the status or having two separate mapping uh, methods here um status pre pairing and now let's say we have the null here it says may not be null just as before and the same is true if we want to update uh, one method and of course it's the wrong resource so let's include um, a string then it says the status must be collected and if we include the, uh, the correct status then it will be uh, two for no content again. So now you saw how you can add your own validation logic and even with own um, templates and outputs that helps the developers. So now you see how you have the full control over your output, uh, how your output looks like, and also how you read from JSON. And let's move on one bit to include hypermedia controls. So as you saw, and, and as now you have the full control over how the actions look like, of course you can also now add the actions metadata for this. And in my um, GitHub project you will um, of the coffee shop, you will see the full example how this looks like using JSONP. But I hope you now get the story how this is done. And another thing to mention. So here you can also include actions now and so on and so forth. If you change the output from the order to JSON object, for example. So let's 
just um, change this example. Again, create order JSON from order. And this will now create a JSON object from the order. JSON create object builder, just as before. And now we want to include um, information like the type and the origin and the status. Type order. Um, get type. origin, status, get origin and get status, name to lowercase and now this um, lowercase is actually the same thing that I did before by annotate the values with, uh, with add XML enum. So now we don't need this anymore as this is now just solely business logic, how our domain entities, or in this case, the enums, look like. And everything else is pushed to the JAX REST level. So let's include everything to our JSON object and then add it together. This is true for the properties. And now we also want to include the actions. In this um, case, and that's the JSON object again with collect coffee. This is our business action here. Which is another nested JSON object with the HTTP method, the href and fields. Collect coffee will be um, a put. Um, the href will be the um, order URI. And then we will have fields as well, which will be an array builder. In this case, with another nested object created from, in my example for this pseudo content type, name and value. Name, at first it's status type origin. And the status will be collected. And then we can add um, another field. With now type and the origin. And this is now derived from the actual um, order. And the URI is created in the same way as before. Now we have a crazy complex uh, JSON output, which will be our um, hypermedia control, now pointing to the action. And now you see, and this is um, why I said you want to have more control, of course you only want to include the action if the coffee hasn't been collected yet, because otherwise the action won't be available. And this is actually uh, something else we could then check in our um, business logic, 
in the EJB, for example, if the um, coffee already has been collected, then we say, oh, you can collect it twice. So then it's uh, both you will throw an exception if uh, you try, but even up front, you don't provide the action to the client. And this is the nice story then, as I said in the first episode, the business logic moves to the server side because then the client wouldn't say, oh, if action, uh, if status is not equal collected, then include a collect button rather than just the client knows actions, collect coffee, I know what that is, I map it to my button. And if it's not included, then it's probably not available and possible. Which means we have a builder here. And then if some business logic matches. For example, if the status is not collected yet, then builder at the action and at the end build it together. And this is the dynamic which you get by using a programmatic approach. And if we retry the example again by saying now we want to query our order again then we get the action of a collect um, coffee or it's it's not included if it has been um, collected already status collected um, espresso from colombia in this case so that's basically it how you use it using the JSONP approach. And of course, you now saw that it's quite cumbersome to create these JSON objects and also to create the URIs because you're, well, repeating yourself all over again here all over the place. And of course, this is not what you would do in an enterprise project rather than you have a single point of responsibility, normally um, a CDI managed object, which then is capable of creating um, JSON to POJOs and vice versa. So then you have one specific place where all that mapping logic is, and then you get the idea that it's actually not that cumbersome to use because you only write one such um, class per application, or actually per module, or depends how you want to structure this. But you don't repeat yourself all over again like I did here. And then of course you have nested, you could have nested methods to create actions and so on and so forth. And how that looks like, um, you can see in another GitHub project of mine, which is called Jack's Rest Hypermedia. So for the sake of the example, and as well this is true in the first episode, I used some pseudo content type um, which I just made up with these links and the actions to give you the idea how this is used. But for the real world examples, you can use a hypermedia enabled content type like Siren. And I've chosen Siren because I think it's usable in a quite productive way as it doesn't add that much meta information to your entities, but still it, it's capable of actions and links. And as you saw, and as you can see here, it's in, included like this and it looks actually quite similar with a few other uh, meta information. But this project here defines an example applic application with the bookstore and also provides several approaches how to realize this. And as I said just now, you will then have, I included um, two CDI managed beans in this case, one builder um, class responsible to um, build POJOs to JSON. And then you see it's one single point of responsibility here and all the JAXRS boundaries then only use this logic and they are lean again and don't include all the mapping functionality. And the same is true for the link builders. And here you see that the POJOs are then um, mapped to URIs, for example. It says for this book and then internally it, al uh, it adds all the paths together and so on and so forth. So for now, for 
as in Jaxorus 2.0, you can't um, rely on being capable of at inject URI infos to any CDI uh, managed object. It works on some implementations, but it's um, but it's not part of the standard yet. We're now in the expert group trying to uh, incorporate this as well. Then you can add inject the link builder and, and in the link builder you could add inject the current URI info of the current request. Um, but actually now you would have to pass it. But doing this approach you have two single point of responsibilities for the, li uh, for the links and the entities so you don't repeat yourself all over again in the JAX REST resources. And you can, um, I will upload this project on GitHub as well, as soon as it's fully implemented with all the links and the actions here, with the fully fledged hypermedia example using the JSONP approach. And the other approach, you got the story as well, hopefully, how POJOs are mapped um, within JAX REST back and forth with requests and responses. And now I hopefully I hope you um, get the story when to use which approach, like what uh, pros and cons it has to map um, POJOs or to use JSONP. So again, you have more flexibility by doing in JSONP, of course. But if you don't need that flexibility, for example, if your JSON output looks exactly the same like your POJOs or you like your domain entities, the entity beans, then just return them into JAXRS and optionally control them via annotations and the declarative approach. This is both uh, doable. And one word about external dependencies. As I said, this project includes uh, several uh, possibilities um, how this Siren example is realized uh, on the server side. So either you do the plain Java EE approach like I did which just creates JSONP, for example, or of course POJOs, then you will be uh, playing Java anyway. But there are also some libraries available for specific content types. For example, Siren content type, it's quite complex to in include that all that meta information. And you may want to use some dependency who already does that for you. And then, for example, um, provide some nice um, programmatic interfaces and builder patterns to create these. So you could do this, of course, to not reinvent the wheel. Um, there is a library called Siren4j and it's uh, nice and usable, but the downside it is it includes some transitive dependencies. For example, it has a declarative approach mapping um, via J, uh, Jackson, JSON mapping framework. And then this, of course, is included in your server or would even collide with some already existent um, JSON mapping implementation and so on and so forth. So this is my story and my approach in general that if you can avoid third party dependencies, if they're only technically um, reasoned, then avoid them if you can. And maybe you write that single point of responsibility in order to, to get rid of a uh, few of them. I actually um, developed an own external dependency, an own, I wouldn't call it a library because it's uh, very small and lean. It's called Siren for Java EE. And the thing is, it only includes the Java EE API, which is provided, so it doesn't have any transitive dependencies. And it has an approach with a builder pattern, so it already includes the logic with properties and links and actions for this Siren example, so you don't have to write all that logic yourself, which means you can create actions and it already has predefined methods. So you could either use this or use the Siren for J approach if you want and and add some dependencies, or you can go just lean with Java EE and write that in one class for yourself. So I hope you now got the idea what is um, doable on the server side and how to realize um, REST APIs, how to map um, your objects to, Jack, um, to either JSON or something else using HTTP, how to map the HTTP information back and forth in JAXRS and also how to include um, validation logic.
And as I said in the first episode, I'm offering workshops to this topic um, in particular and enterprise application developer uh, development with Java and Java EE in general, also continuous delivery pipelines and so on and so forth. If you're interested in that, then feel free to contact me. So I hope you got the idea how this is realized on the server side. And the next episode will be um, about the client side. So how REST APIs and in, um, in specific hypermedia REST APIs are consumed with the client and how these links and actions are finally followed. Because now on the server side, we provide all the information, how to use an API and how to follow these processes. And then on the client side, you have to actually do it and what is possible on the client side then using Java and ideally using just plain Java. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.